Once again, welcome everyone. We're pleased to have you with us here today as we conclude the 2023 Inside US Foreign Policy Virtual Series. Today's webinar aims to explore a critically important foreign policy issue, the subject of technology, innovation, and the CHIPS Act, with a special emphasis on our efforts to enhance the technology and innovation landscape in the East Asia and Pacific region, including the work being done by our colleagues at the US mission to Vietnam. In addition to insights related to US policy and our efforts in the realm of international science and technology, today's event will offer important insights into the broader US foreign policy process, along with information on State Department scholarship, internship, fellowship, as well as career opportunities. My name is Anthony Kolaha, and I'm the Director of the Office of Global Educational Programs within the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. In this role, I oversee efforts to attract qualified international students to the United States through our Education USA Global Advising Network and to increase and diversify Americans taking part in study abroad through our USA Study Abroad programs, such as the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program, the Critical Language Scholarship or CLS program, and our Ideas program, which builds study abroad capacity at US colleges and universities, among other initiatives. These programs support our broader US foreign policy through the individual experiences and relationships that are formed through international education. Among the most urgent foreign policy challenges facing the United States and nations around the world is promoting a global economy that is dynamic, resilient, and accessible to people and nations across the globe. Ensuring a healthy global economy and encouraging and harnessing the benefits derived from technological innovation is both a collective opportunity as well as a responsibility. The US commitment to promoting a vibrant global economy remains a core pillar of our foreign policy. As Secretary of State Antony Blinken says, promoting innovation and nurturing technological partnerships domestically and internationally is, and I quote, front and center to our foreign policy. First, because we cannot do any of these things alone as effectively as we can when we're working in partnership and collaboration and cooperation with others. And deepening those collaborations, deepening those partnerships, including on technology is part of our foreign policy. Our keynote speaker and our expert panel today will, will do much more than provide context to Secretary Blinken's remarks. They will offer a rare behind the scenes look at the tireless efforts of the State Department's diplomatic and technical experts to situate technology and innovation at the core of America's foreign policy priorities. And if you're wondering about the connection between today's foreign policy challenges and State Department scholarships and fellowships, well, the simple answer is that the United States is committed to fostering the next generation of diverse American leaders with critical global skills. And our scholarships and exchange programs do just that. The State Department's efforts to increase and diversify study abroad opportunities for all Americans are vital to developing the next generation of talented American professionals in all walks of life including as diplomats, advancing US foreign policy efforts in service to the American people. For those of you interested in a career at the State Department, today's event will provide you with a front row seat as we explore the connections between study abroad and State Department careers. It is through our Gilman program that we're hosting today's event. Today's webinar is the last in our 2023 Inside US Foreign Policy, a six part virtual series focusing on the major foreign policy challenges facing the United States and the world today. The Gilman program provides outstanding US undergraduate students who receive federal Pell Grants with scholarships to study or intern abroad. Since the program began in 2001, more than 41,000 Gilman scholars of diverse backgrounds from all US states and territories have studied abroad in over 150 countries. Finally, I'm pleased to invite all of you to attend an exciting new virtual series to viewing next week. The Gilman Program, in collaboration with Pennsylvania State University, will present a four-part foreign policy and focus global food security webinar series. The first webinar takes place on Friday, February, or on Friday, February 9th at 1 o'clock p.m. And we hope you will register and attend. So please bookmark the Gilman website for the latest information. And now I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Allison Schwer is the Deputy Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State. In this role, she helps to connect science, technology, and innovation to department foreign policy priorities. 
Dr. Schwer's immeasurable contributions to the department include service as the acting science and technology advisor, senior policy advisor in the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor, and with the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs. In her work, Dr. Schwer has advanced a myriad of crucial scientific and technical foreign policy issues, including 5G, semiconductors, research integrity, smart cities, surveillance technologies, science and technology programs and policies in China, North Korean energy, environment, science and technology, and health programs and policies. Prior to the State Department, Dr. Schwer worked in the office of Senator Christopher Coons in the United States Senate, where she served as an energy and environment policy advisor. Dr. Schwer received her PhD and Master's of Science in Chemical Engineering from Columbia University in the city of New York, and her Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and Bachelor of Arts in Music from the Pennsylvania State University. She also worked in Clermont-Ferrand, France, for the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, studying ocean acidification effects in the Mediterranean region. So without further ado, I'm honored to present the Deputy Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State, Dr. Allison Schwer. Allie, over to you. Thank you so, so much, Anthony. And good morning, afternoon, and evening to all participants. I want to thank first USA Study Abroad uh, and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and also the Gilman Scholarship Team at IIE for inviting me to speak with all of you today. Science and technology. These advances will undoubtedly continue to drive the future of national and economic security and prosperity, and they will transform the future of work and wealth. This is not new to you or to anyone. Presidents around the globe for years have discussed the promises and perils of technology, the importance of science, technology, and innovation to tackle global challenges like climate change and health security. It's part of our daily lexicon now. We've seen these incredible shifts within our lifetime. You all likely have personal cell phones and computers much lighter than a brick now, something which is only possible within the last decades. And in the United States, remember, cars only overtook horses on the roads between 1910 and 1930, so barely 100 years ago. Camille Nanjiani, for those of you who like comedians, likes to joke that there are roller coasters in the United States older than sliced bread. So we are living through an age of change. If we all know how important science, technology, and innovation are, I'm going to use STI to describe them moving forward. Over the next 10 minutes, we're going to focus on the issue about the use and utility of STI in diplomacy, which is fundamentally where I've focused my entire career since I received my PhD. Now, mixing science, technology, and innovation, STI, and diplomacy is not necessarily an obvious combination. I have the privilege in my daily career to seeing firsthand how STI can positively impact foreign relations and how US foreign policy can in turn shape STI. One of the great tasks before all of us practicing diplomacy is to educate scientists, engineers, and diplomats about how each increasingly needs the other. This administration has strongly supported innovation since its first days in office. In President Biden's letter on STI, priorities immediately released before taking office, he asked, how can we ensure the long-term health of science and technology in our nation? How can the United States ensure that it is a world leader in the technologies and industries of the future that will be critical to our economic prosperity and national security, especially in competition with the People's Republic of China? How can we ensure the United States will remain a magnet for the best and brightest minds throughout the world? The president recognized that America's STI sector has flourished because of a rich ecosystem of people, policies, and institutions. Scientific discovery, technological breakthroughs, and innovation expand the frontiers of human knowledge and are vital for responding to the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. The innovation within the United States that comes from a strong academic sector within a pluralistic system and spreads throughout an innovation economy in the private sector is part of the reason our bottom-up innovation ecosystem has been so successful over the past century. 
That stature drives international STI cooperation and capacity building efforts. Countries want to work with us and learn from us in some cases because we're a global leader. We, like every country, want to recruit the best minds into our system and have access to brilliant scientists and top-notch facilities outside of our borders. And for academia, basic research is what drives innovation. 2005 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Richard Schrock said, I got here by doing basic research. The value of basic research is you discover something you didn't expect that nobody expected. And just this past fall, three out of five of the American Nobel laureates indicated that they made their discovery that led to their Nobels when they were actually looking for something else. It was fortuitous. So the importance of basic research in the strength as our country in STI, but also in the importance of our role as a partner to other countries on STI cannot be overstated. This administration has prioritized STI. So now it's important we focus on that nexus of STI and foreign policy. And while the Department of State might not seem like an immediate partner for STI, we are. We're a national security agency. Our mandate is to lead foreign policy through diplomacy, advocacy, and assistance by advancing the interests of the American people. We do this by supporting international STEM exchange and student mobility. At the same time, we protect against the unauthorized transfer of sensitive technology by promoting effective export controls and related tools. We foster bilateral cooperation with countries around the world to make sure that you have access to cutting edge research facilities and researchers. And we engage with private sector to enhance public private partnerships at an even higher level. We work with partners, allies, and like-minded countries to make sure the principles that have supported our academic ecosystem for decades are shared, agreed upon, and emulated by others. These principles are familiar to all of you. Openness, transparency, honesty, equity, fair competition, objectivity. So we know that STI is important to this administration and in terms of how the Department of State engages on it, but how and why does this matter in foreign policy? Technological innovation is disruptive and it's occurring globally. We are in a crossroads in time where innovation can occur and is occurring everywhere. So if global power is going to be disrupted by science and technology, we want to be the disruptors. We want to set the rules for the new playing field. And we want this because in that way, we can ensure that science and technology serves the US people, protects our interest and upholds our democratic values. We want to remain the standard setters and innovative powerhouse that we are to ensure the universal rights and democratic values remain at the center of innovation and deliver real benefits to the world. Science diplomacy has facilitated the cooperation of scientists towards averting deadly conflict in the past. Concerned scientists of all political persuasion collaborated in the post-World War II period to address the threats of nuclear weapons and their proliferation, and committees on international security and arms control in both the United States and Russia spurred unlikely communication between scientists of both nations. Those talks are credited with paving the way for President Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev to come to the table together. So we try to empower people with science and technology because solutions can come from anywhere and will more often than not be an idea that is developed and tested by teams that span national and institutional borders. We need a mix of all scientific di disciplines working across borders to come up with these creative solutions that are sensitive to the needs of society and that will actually work. And we need diplomats who can communicate to scientists and engineers our most pressing policy challenges so that we can develop those real and meaningful solutions. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the draw scientist experiment, but I want to talk about it briefly because it's so telling about why this is important. Between 1966 and 1977, nearly 5,000 elementary school children, mostly from Canada and the United States, were asked to draw a scientist. This was a social science study led by researcher David Chambers. And in those drawings in the first 5,000, 28 students, depicted a female scientist, all of them drawn by girls. No boy drew a woman scientist. This experiment has been redone over five decades, 78 different studies at this point, and children are now much more likely to draw a female scientist. From the 1980s forward, on average, a quarter of children drew women compared to 0.6% in Chambers' original study. The barriers in diversity in STEM in STI, and thus the best innovative solutions are very real 
and those barriers are systemic. So they require explicit attention to address. Women make up just one third of the STEM workforce in the United States, but make up half of the population. In 2019, women accounted for 65% of social scientists, but only 26% of computer and mathematical scientists and 16% of engineers. These statistics show the importance in continuing to work on these issues, not only domestically, but to partner with and develop capacity with the rest of the world on STI. This is why Secretary Blinken has endeavored to build technology and to nearly all of our diplomatic engagements, tech by tech, issue by issue, bilaterally, multilaterally, always looking to assemble the right configurations of allies and partners to get things done. He calls this variable geometry. So for all the nerds out there, go science and go math. Fundamentally, we're doing this because as President Biden noted in, in the 2022 National Security Strategy, we must work with other nations to address shared challenges, to improve the lives of the American people and those of people around the world, whether it is by making investments at home or by deepening cooperation with other countries that share our vision. But we're able to do it because there are STEM professionals, scientists like myself and diplomats throughout the entire department and the US government thinking about the critical nexus of STI and foreign policy. Later this morning, you'll hear about job opportunities in the department. And in just a few minutes, you'll hear from a panel about how, how the bipartisan Chips and Science Act of 2022 has strengthened manufacturing and supply chains and invested in STI in the workforce. Historic investments like this and other laws that have passed, like the Inflation Reduction Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law, increase our competitiveness and our security. I want to close by recognizing, recognizing and thanking all of you. Our higher education research colleagues, institutions, students studying STEM and other disciplines for the vital work you do every day to expand global knowledge, research, and innovation in the United States and around the world. Your efforts are critical to our domestic policy and our foreign policy, and you're going to learn even more about why in the sessions ahead. I would like to turn now to Jeremiah Azarin, who will moderate the panel discussion. Jeremiah is a Gilman Scholarship alum and also a Foreign Affairs Information Technology Fellow who is currently serving at the U.S. Consulate General in Mumbai. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the program, and I hope to see you at some point in the future. Jeremiah, with that, over to you. Thank you again, Dr. Trier, for speaking with us about the use and utility of SCI in diplomacy and foreign policy. And with that, this is where I want to start with our panel and the themes they'll share as a part of a team working to advance U.S. foreign policy on technology, innovation, and the CHIPS Act at the U.S. Department of State. We'll cover some key elements relating to these important issues, but with a special point of view of the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs, the Bureau of East Asian Pacific Affairs, and the U.S. Mission to Vietnam. And then we'll open up discussion for questions from the audience submitted via the chat. So without further ado, let's kick off with intros. And so I already had the mic, I'll just start. I'm your moderator for today. Um, good evening, I'm coming from Mumbai, India. My name is Jeremiah. Um, I'm a diplomatic technology officer, which means I handle all things administration of the tech systems at the department. Um, for my academic background, I studied art, psychology, and computer science at Harvard, where I was also a Gilman scholar, like some of you. Um, I did my uh, study abroad experience in South Korea. And after that term study abroad, I became one of the pilot fellows for the new Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship, which is one of the new pilot pipeline fellowships um, into the tech side of the department. So if you want to learn more, I'll be at the breakout room number five for an informal Q&A about that. Um, and so I'll pass off the baton over to Senior Foreign Service Officer and CHIPS Act International Technology, Technology Security and Innovation Senior Coordinator, Virginia Kent. Thank you. And, and I'd like to thank the organizers and ECA for, for inviting me here today. I'm super happy to be part of this, this conversation. It's incredibly timely and critical. Um, and, and like I said, I, I think it's, it's exciting to, to be able to, to share sort of what we're doing um, broader. So um, as noted, I am the Economic Bureau, the, the CHIPS Act, it's the senior coordinator. And I've been in this role about a year. I've been in the Foreign Service as a Foreign Service Officer for about 20 years, um, a little over now, and uh, was a serial 
um, study abroad student growing up and, and high school and college, um, and then just uh, really had to, to get into foreign policy and, and have loved uh, every year that I've, I've been in. So I have a breakout session as well later um, to kind of get into more of the CHIPS Act details and various things that, that ITSE is doing. Um, but happy to also take other questions uh, and anything in the breakout session that I can help with. So um, I just want to step back and, and do a little bit of intro about the CHIPS Act because it is incredibly uh, profound in, in its ability to marry up um, you know, the tech world to policy. And so as one of the largest you know, incentives or industrial policies that the United States has put forward in decades, um, you know, when it came into effect in August of 22, you know, the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors, or the CHIPS Act, um, is, is an incredible piece of, of legislation. It's bipartisan. Um, it's $52, $53 billion of, of funding. And $50 billion of that is going to the Commerce Department's CHIPS team. And their funding is very much focused on bringing that um, investment into the United States. It is only to be spent on U.S. soil. They're looking to, to partner with U.S. companies, but also our foreign uh, partners, companies can also apply to to be part of this incredible opportunity to bring you know semiconductor fabs and the research and the development and the design of the semiconductors all back to to the United States. Um, the really kind of brilliant part also about the Chips Act is it created ITSE, so that's the International Technology Security and Innovation Fund, and it was in full recognition that we cannot do this alone, nor should we do this alone. And so the ITSE fund was created, it's 100 million per year for five years, so $500 million, and all of our money is to be spent overseas with our partners, building those workforce needs, building the various um, regulatory reforms that are needed to, to basically create the best economic environment in our partner countries to grow that needed supply chain of the semiconductors globally. And so we have a variety of programs that we're working with in the Americas and in the Indo-Pacific regions that are really focused on that delta of where are the current workforce needs and how do we get what industry actually needs. And as you, you might be familiar with sort of the Domestic CHIPS Act, we need 100,000 technicians and tens of thousands of engineers to build what we want to build with the CHIPS Act. And our partners overseas, as they're critical partners of ours in the semiconductor supply chain, they need to grow equally, their technicians and others. And so from the Economic Bureau's perspective, we are working with our partners in the regional bureaus, and I know you'll hear from them, and also our partners in our partner countries. Um, and, and we have, you know, this overarching, really amazing opportunity to take this bipartisan legislation and trans translate that in to policy and partnerships, the collaboration that the doctor was mentioning earlier, Dr. Schweier, about how can we build these linkages and how is that translated? And so it kind of starts with, with where that funding resides. So it's in the Economic Bureau, it's in a couple of our extra, our um, sister bureaus, I would say, but then it also works with our regional bureaus and we have them here today and we have our post um, embassy colleagues that, that kind of take it even further down into the implementation process with our partners in country. And it's an incredible process that I'd like to just um, turn it back to Jeremiah to kind of go through the sort of next step of, of where we are as far as um, moving, moving that um, policy into action on the ground, workforce development on the ground, let's say in Vietnam with our Vietnamese partners. So thank you and, and over to you, Jeremiah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, up next, we have Country Public Affairs Officer to U.S. Mission to Vietnam, Mary Beth Poli. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Hanoi, uh, where it's surprisingly cold. You would not imagine how cold Hanoi gets, climate change. Um, so I am been in the Foreign Service for almost 20 years. I've spent most of my career around Asia, China, Manila, Indonesia. I spent some time back in D.C., I've worked historically um, in public diplomacy, primarily public affairs. The last four or five years, I've spent a lot of time working on uh, information integrity and protecting media spaces around the world, um, which really introduced me to technology policy broadly. Um, I, unfortunately, because of the late hour, it's after 11 p.m. here. I won't be joining the talks afterward, but um, my friends and colleagues at IAE can always pass on my address, email address if you have any questions specifically about public diplomacy. 
Um, I would say that I arrived in Vietnam on August 1st uh, to find out that President Biden was headed here to make a very historic announcement in which we upgraded bilateral ties, a historic double upgrade, um, which is incredible if you think only 30 years ago, uh, we had just a normalized relations following the war. So as part of those negotiations, there were things that the Vietnamese wanted and there are things that we wanted. And at the heart of that was partnership in technology and innovation, particularly around semiconductors, but around other areas as well. And so I think when you think about um, semiconductors, it can seem far away. For Vietnam, it's their future. And they see us as a partner. Um, and they're a critical partner for us in the Indo-Pacific. So I look forward to sharing more about that and how this played a role in our diplomatic relations here. Thank you so much. And finally, we have the Indo-Pacific Unit Chief at the Economic Policy Office of the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, David Peterson. Hi, Jeremiah. Um, thanks very much. It's uh, it's an honor to be here with colleagues like uh, and friends like Mary, Mary Beth and uh, Virginia. Um, I'm looking forward to having the chance to interact with everybody today. Uh, my name is David Peterson, and as you mentioned, I work in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs uh, Economic Policy Office. So uh, in my office, we focus on, uh, you know, broadly uh, economic policy across the region and on issues like promoting regional economic integration, strategic infrastructure development, and digital connectivity. Um, so in that work, you know, we've we've worked closely with Virginia's office and with folks at, at, at Post on uh, uh, how we can add into the, those efforts from the, the regional bureau perspective. Um, I'm also a foreign service officer. I've been in for about 15 years and I've worked in China, Japan, India, and Eastern Europe, as well as on the, the China desk and, and uh, in the Economic and Business Affairs Bureau uh, in the past. Um, I also started kind of my path towards the foreign service with a study abroad experience for me uh, at Kanagawa University in Japan. Um, happy to chat with folks about the path that that, that led me here uh, later on. Um, yeah, and that's that's about it. Look forward to the discussion. All right. So as you can see, we come from a variety of backgrounds, from the development and administration of tech to the policy and management side of it at the department, as well as a breadth of good work in countries represented too. So well, why is this work that we all do so important, right? So that's where I really want to start this panel off. I want to begin broadly with the question to Virginia, why? Why is this work important to you and to the U.S. people? Um, great question. Um, so the, the simple answer is these are, this is a critical industry and a critical piece of technology, the semiconductor industry. This is, this is going to be um, over the next 20 years, uh, basically, the area that will dominate the control of technology and the manufacturing of those semiconductors, we really have to bring back to the United States for a lot of national security reasons um, and economic you know, security reasons. And so if you think about the partnerships that we're building with, with our partners overseas through the ITSE fund and through um, you know, the EAP Bureau, the East Asia Pacific Bureau and, and, and in country, um, these are the things that are going to make American jobs more secure in the United States. It's going to grow the semiconductor industry globally. It's going to diversify it. It's going to make it healthier. So you wouldn't see sort of the, the, the really dramatic impacts that COVID had um, in certain countries when they, they were hit by COVID waves. It created these shock waves through these supply chains that directly affects the United States and Americans in the sense of we didn't have semiconductors for medical machinery that we definitely need. So we had all of these sort of shockwaves in that supply chain. And that, that is exactly why the ITSE fund is, is cognizant of the fact that we have to have global partners if we're going to be strong and successful in our own technology policies and our own industrial policies. So it's, it's part of a recognition of that and partly um, recognizing that that to do this, to be successful, the CHIPS Act, we have to have our international partners coming along with us to build that resiliency along the ways. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. So on this theme of recognition, 
Um, I want to ask now, David, could you tell us about an example of a program promoting technology innovation and the CHIPS Act that you've particularly been proud of and what made it successful? Sure. Um, so in my office, as I mentioned, we have a focus on promoting um, connectivity and critical infrastructure in the East Asia and Pacific region. And one of the specific areas we've been working on in recent years is the is subsea cables access for smaller countries, particularly the Pacific Island countries. Um, so international fiber optic, these subseas cables are an essential part of the information and communication technology infrastructure. It's kind of the backbone of the, the digital economy. A lot of us don't realize that the undersea cables, they carry over 99% of all the, the traffic um, crossing the ocean that, that really makes up the internet. And they represent uh, you know, a huge amount of, of uh, economic transactions every day. They support high paying jobs and they increase uh, innovation and productivity and spur growth. Um, we saw kind of in the aftermath of events like uh, volcanic, uh, eruption in Tonga a few years ago, the importance of uh, these cables when, when countries get cut off. Um, and I, I was just, it, this example is kind of front of mind because I was just out in the region promoting a new program that we're working on around the Central Pacific in um, helping uh, private sector partners create a, a cable, um, that a, a, a new cable system that we hope will provide new connectivity to um, most of the countries in the Pacific I Island uh, region. Um, you know, countries, some of them now have have access, but it's not redundant. So they're 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 vulnerable to to uh, disruption and some of them have no access at, at all. And in, in speaking with some folks from the countries that have like very little or very weak access to the Internet, uh, last week, you realize just how profound that kind of uh, that that disconnection is. As people struggle to work, you know, they have to fly to another country to do a video conference like that. You can imagine how how difficult it is to develop your economy when you you don't have that that capability and uh, challenges in terms of uh, being able to study or get access to things like telemedicine. And so it's a uh, it's critical to import uh, in, to um, support that connectivity. Um, and th this project's not done yet, so it's not a success, but I think if it, if and when it is um, complete, this, the success will be kind of the cooperative nature of it, um, working with, you know, U.S. government capabilities that come from things like uh, Virginia's uh, ITSE program and uh, partners in the region like uh, Australia and others, as well as the, you know, immense resources that comes from the, the private sector and how we're able to kind of leverage that uh that cooperation to uh to I mean, take advantage of everyone's uh strengths i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you so much so now i want to shift sort of into sort of the long term um my question now is for mary beth within your work focusing on the intersection of technology and the information ecosystem the million dollar question now is how can we support the development and growth of technology and innovation in a manner that is sustainable for the future well i think it comes down to partnerships right so as virginia said this is not meant the funding that we're getting through itsy and we piled on funding from other public diplomacy resources for english language training and to adjust our scholarship availability it's not meant to as a gift it's meant to build sustainable partnerships between the private sector and not just u.s companies but vietnamese companies companies from third country partners and allies um, as a partnership to really build the workforce here and build and attract um, the companies to stay and then make continuous and scale up those investments. So I do think it's really important to think of sometimes programs like ITC as the beginning, and then what we're going to build on there will hopefully go far beyond that funding um, through public private partnerships and also through commitments from other governments. So here in Vietnam, you have a very large presence of South Korea and Japan, but you also have a Vietnamese government that's quite clear. They want to have 55,000 engineers uh, ready to go. And so we emphasize to them that this is a partnership. So how are you, what are you investing? What are you bringing to the table? How are we doing this together? Um, 
And so that, in, that includes a lot of long-term investments for them. Starts with education reform. Um, they have no formalized STEM education. They do quite well. They have an incredibly talented workforce, but we really need to get see some STEM curriculum reform, a STEM curriculum in place, and then additional reforms to enable these higher partnerships between U.S. institutions and Vietnamese institutions, along with private sector investment, to really sustain this in the long term. So when we start here, we're already looking down ten years. What happens if something changes and there is no funding? We don't want it just to be a moment where we connected and we had this great celebration of how much we can do together. We really want to get it done. And that's really bringing in a lot of other actors to work cohesively. Um, and sometimes the power of the US government and the power of diplomats is just the convening power we have when we can bring different people to the table um, and we can get them energized and organized. Um, some of the most impactful programs are really like the gift of the US government was the organization not necessarily the money or um, the location, but just the ability to organize people in a way that can be scaled. See, thank you, thank you. So now I have a question for back to you, Virginia. What does or will success look like with issues relating to technology innovation and the CHIPS Act? Yeah, so I think Mary Beth gave us a good preview, but but for the the ITSE team and, and the funding that we have, Congress um, you know, was also had some foresight to say that for five years we have funding. So it's it's a program that has the ability to think longer term, which is to Mary Best's point, incredibly important to, to building up a strategy and building up those partnerships with, um, with our government and, and overseas and our partners overseas to make sure that what we do just doesn't, you know, it's a flashbang kind of thing and then it's gone. So everything that we've talked about, especially from the, the CHIPS ITSE team, is it's a, it's a long-term relationship we're talking about. It's, it's five to 10 years. Um, and what success would look like is ultimately a much larger, more diverse supply chain um, in semiconductor supply chains. And so for us, we're talking about the assembly, the testing, the packaging that has to go into the, 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 the entire part of making it, including the critical materials that are needed on the upstream, as we call it. So we're looking at the upstream materials that are needed for semiconductors. The commerce team is focused on sort of that middle part of this, the supply chain, growing that in the United States, bringing those fabs, bringing the R&D, growing all of that design work in the US. And then, then you see ITSE again on the downstream, which is the assembly testing and packaging. And so this entire global supply chain has to be um, more diverse and more robust to be able to manage sort of the, the, the economic shocks or the various sort of things, natural disasters, anything that's coming in the next five to 10 years. And so that sort of resiliency in the global supply chain would be sort of the end game success. And we would say to our partners that they have large, vibrant ecosystems that they've created um, over the last, you know, over the the coming five years, let's say, and, and be able to build in workforce development, build in regulatory re, you know, reforms, build in those things that are, are needed for private industry. And everything that we've talked about too has a transparency component to it. So we very much want that open transparency in economic policy so that we, we have whole programs and I'll, I'll happily talk about it in the, in the, the chat um, later, the breakout session, but a lot of the work we're doing is also to to make sure we're being collaborative and talk to our partners so we don't do that that subsidy war that you'll read about when you read about the chips act oh they're you know the eu chips act the uk chips act so a lot of what we do is partner with our our partners overseas to make sure that we are transparent with our policies we are building you know collaborative relationships and collaborative platforms bilaterally multilaterally to make sure that collectively we build the very best and strongest sort of supply chains that we can. And, and that is a, a, a significant reflection of the importance that we've put on partnerships um, overseas with, with critical partners, but also how that feeds back to, to being successful in this entire endeavor of this, the largest industrial, one of the largest industrial policies um, that we've put into place in the United States. So it's very much interconnected and, um, you know, it has, it has a long-term view and it has a long-term perspective. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking on that partnership 
and the relationship. Uh, I want to ask now, Mary Beth, how do other aspects of our bilateral relationships, so either within trade or research and development or intellectual property rights, medication, all that, come into play when seeking progress on some of these issues? Well, I think um, the president's visit is a great example to go back to um, and how it unfolded. You know, um, the upgrade in relations to the highest level in the Vietnamese system was decades in the making, and it took many investments uh, of time and energy and passion on both sides to rebuild trust. And so as we got close to this moment, um, and it was very clear what Vietnam wanted this partnership in STEM education and workforce development, really opened the door for us to say, Okay, if you if you want that, if you want to, uh, we we know you want to improve and empower your citizens to have better jobs in clean industry. Um, you're going to have to also make changes in terms of clean energy, right? U.S. companies aren't going to come here. Foreign companies aren't going to keep coming here and expanding investments. They have net zero commitments um, to address climate change. So it really opened the door, especially on environmental issues, to say upskilling is is one thing, but upskilling. Um, into a company, a foreign company, you're going to have to make this environment much more attractive for expanded investment. And that includes, you know, clean energy, it included uh, increasing intellectual property rights protections, it includes uh, transparency in the legal system here and the permitting process. So really it was a gateway to talk about a lot of other issues. And then there are also things that the U.S. wants to see, right? It's not, it wasn't just the things they wanted, we really got into a very meaty discussion about other changes we want to see um, as partners, kind of where we see this relationship going. And so that was just the beginning of a series of very um, targeted discussions around a whole nother set of issues that led to the historic upgrade and I think like a 13 page fact sheet that covers everything from security cooperation to human rights to people to people ties. I'm um, in a really historic moment. Um, and it really came down to kind of this new and future generation of partnership in science and technology um, that really spurred and kind of let, opened a lot of doors for us and has kept opening doors. Um, so it was just a really incredible moment and continues to be a, an incredible opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So on that note of opportunity, I want to uh, ask David now our next question. What are the important distinctions between bilateral versus multilateral diplomacy in this space? Hmm. Um, great question. Uh, right, so as I mentioned before, so in the speaking from the, the regional bureau's perspective, um, you know, one of the primary roles that we have is to manage the range of bilateral relationships along with, with folks at uh, embassies in the region um, across the countries that, that we deal with. And um, just it kind of struck me uh, in the East Asia region, um, we've really seen, you know, as, as like very obvious from our, our discussion today, that technology and innovation have come to the, the forefront of the, the set of issues that we deal with, uh, with all of our partners on. So the other day I saw um, a, a fact sheet that I had worked on recently for uh, when Prime Minister Albanese from Australia had a, a state visit last October. And so, first of all, for folks in the audience uh, who don't know, maybe the the, the amount of the of blood, sweat, and tears, and time that go into working on these uh, outcome statements that that uh, Mary Beth was was talking about before, um, it's it's incredible. And I, I often wonder how how much the folks are poring over these documents when we're finished with them. But when you when you look at them afterwards, it's kind of a a snapshot of you know where the relationships are at and and they highlight the the most important things that uh that we're talking about and when i looked at the australia document i think depending on how you define um technology and innovation you know nearly half or more of the points in the document and especially like all, uh, everything from the the top uh about a quarter of a way down were related to technology and innovation um so uh yeah, so so I, I think that uh, it, that that importance is is uh, kind of striking when you when you think about it. Um, but in terms of how we approach things from a regional perspective and a multilateral perspective, um, in I mean regionally in 
the East Asia and Pacific Bureau, along with our colleagues in the South Central uh, Asia Bureau, we kind of take our cues from the administration's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. And so that's a document that the Biden administration released in 2022 that kind of outlines our, our overall approach to the region. Um, in my office, we focus on uh, the prosperity pillar, as we call it, uh, of the, the policy. But um, the, the strategy kind of it seeks to create what, what we like to call the, the lattice work of mutually reinforcing initiatives uh, where we work with allies and partners and in, in groups and different formations to advance uh, a common vision for the, the region. Um, on the economic front, the Indo-Pacific strategy prosperity pillar is uh, comprised of uh, several different initiatives. One of them is something my office works closely on. It's called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, um, which is a large grouping of, of uh, 21 countries in the in the region that operates on consensus uh, and includes um, countries like Russia and China. So it's 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 uh, it's a, a uh, an, an interesting um, dynamics uh, come out of that, but um, it's kind of uh, in terms of policy, it, it can be uh, kind of a laboratory for, for new innovative policy because it's, um, well, at its basis, it's non-binding. So um, the, the because of the non-binding nature of uh, much of the policy discussions there, we have kind of experts at different in, from different uh, um, policy buckets, including tech and innovation, who can experiment with new approaches to, um, to, to kind of finding common rules of the road and how we approach things like technology. And those experiments can, can filter up in, into other more binding uh, uh, um, agreements in the, in the future we find. Uh, we also, part of that lattice work of, of agreements are, are groupings like the uh, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations with which we have an important partnership, um, the Quad, uh, our partnership with uh, Australia, Japan, and India that um, that that approaches a lot of our our infrastructure work in the region, and uh, something that's been in the news a lot lately, the the Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Framework, uh, IPEF. Um, yeah, so those uh, those all kind of form important parts of the multilateral um, network that uh, kind of binds us together with the partners in the region. Gotcha, gotcha, thank you. And so before we wrap up um, this part and then open up for questions from the audience, I just wanted to open a question for all three of you. What are some final thoughts about science and diplomacy and how that, uh, why folks here are listening um, how, and how, why did you, did you care? I'll start off uh, with you, Virginia. Okay, so why should you care? So you think about what's powering AI, what's powering all of this technology growth. Um, frankly, it's it's semiconductors, it's chips. So you think about how the U.S. is going to position itself to be a leader in this area, to be that that sort of strong economic power um, in the future from from everything that's going to stem from the growth of AI, from the stem the growth of all of these things. Um, it's, it's building and designing, it's the R&D, it's the production of the semiconductors. So from where I sit, I think it's one of the biggest issues in technology. Um, and I think it has, you know, incredible growth opportunities. You know, you, you see that technology growth, you know, it just, it goes up exponentially when you introduce AI. And so where we're going to be even in two years or in five years, it's gonna be radically different. Um, and those countries that are, are able to capture and galvanize that technology and be the owners of sort of the rules of the road and, and, and how that is, is working is incredibly key. So therefore, from, my, you know, from where I sit, the policy part of this is incredibly important that we get it right and that we, we marry up the policy with the economic um, security that, that we think is, is incredibly important for, for Americans. Thank you. Yeah. Mary? Um, I fully support everything Virginia said. I'm gonna give an example that's very personal. Um, so I'm the daughter of a Vietnam War veteran and it's been a real opportunity and honor to come back here. Um, and one of the most impactful programs the US government has ever done was something called the Vietnam Educational Fellowship where we 
provided scholarships to 700 Vietnamese over a decade uh, to study, uh, get um, masters and PhDs in the US in STEM education. Those individuals have gone on to lead US companies, to become leaders in their community in the United States, uh, to become leaders here in Vietnam, and are making significant investments in the next generation of Vietnamese. And so some, it, I think this is an incredible foreign policy national security issue, but when we work together, we're also paying dividends on such a personal to person basis. And you just watch um, how our partnership really inspires others to get back. And so I just want to emphasize that is that has been one of the most amazing things to see how these individuals are now leading STEM education voluntarily with their own money in Vietnam. Excellent. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we're just going to pass over the mic to you all, the audience, with questions from the chat. So if you have any, just feel free to type them below and they'll be passed on over to me. So our starter question from the audience. For anyone on the panel, how does the U.S. find the balance between economic competition and cooperation with other countries? I'm happy to start, but probably David has has a lot of that just from the regional perspective as well. So the work that we're doing in ITSI, we're doing it, um, like I said, we're doing multilaterally, but we're also working um, bilaterally. And there's a there is a balance there. But for example, the multilateral area where we are working with, you know, um, the OECD, which is, um, you know, uh, organization economic development and they have they have a lot of deep economic ties and so we have about 40 economies that we get together with regularly and we discuss sort of the key leading issues for the semiconductor industry in the supply chain and we bring industry together educational institutions labor unions um, think tanks all sorts of sort of experts in that area to basically bring all of us up to the same page so that we talk about it um, in the same way, we're actually working on a taxonomy uh, system because we often don't even talk about chips in the same way. How are we going to classify some of these things? So there's a lot of work we do multilaterally that that is incredibly important to to making sure our understanding with our partners is 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 the same and that our goals are clearly delineated between between all of the various economies and the governments. And then bilaterally, we also work very, you know, a bit more deep, if you would, about how is it that they're putting their industrial policies together? How can we be complementary? And how can we really um, use all of our resources collectively as governments? And, and the question we're always asking um, educational institutions or industry or, or labor unions is, what does the government need to do? Like, what do we need to do as, as the government to help get us there like how do we get to that successful vision that i kind of laid out earlier and and where does government need to play a role and how can we be that 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 sort of um key part of of the story and so we're always sort of really focused on that nexus and how we can we can do that partnership so um, i know probably others have have um different perspectives from where they're sitting so thanks Sure, I'll just, I, I, I won't, uh, I mean, I, I agree with everything that, that Virginia said, and she said a, a, a lot of it right there. Um, yeah, obviously, I think that there's always a balance to be struck uh, between competition and collaboration. Um, you know, this, the, our secretary said it best that with certain partners in the region, we should be competitive when we should be, and collaborative when we can be, and adversarial when we have to be. Um, but I think that you know, from where I sit, you know, it's mostly, you know, trying to, or, or our focus is mostly kind of along the lines of what Virginia said, like looking at specific policy sets and, you know, how we need to address them um, to find a solution that works for everyone. Um, and I would say, you know, 98%, 95% of my time is, is spent looking for collaborative opportunities. Um, and and the, the focus is mostly there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so another question we have from the audience is, what type of policy or research is being pursued to determine how the United States can provide the best environment for technological breakthroughs? And what role does use-inspired research, as opposed to basic research, play in chips related to science diplomacy, if any? 
That's like five questions in one. Um, <laughs> um, I'm happy to take a couple of them, frankly. So as part of the CHIPS Act, the National Science Foundation did receive a large chunk. The Department of Commerce has about 11 billion for R&D. So if you're talking about where the government and research and technology are really close and that cutting edge type of technology that I'm talking about is chip design, how are we going to, you know, with AI growing the chips themselves at the current state, like you get to chat GBT 4.0 or whatever, like the chips aren't powerful enough to even move and manage all this, this data we're talking about. We are talking about an incredible amount of data. So those nexuses are there between the National Science Foundation, the research labs, our DOD commons, it's called, which is a part of the, the CHIPS Act. They're also receiving funding for sort of critical development of R&D and technology. And so um, all of those areas are very much focused on those, those, those really cutting edge, higher end, um, sort of technology needs that, that industry knows we need, our, our own government national security apparatus knows we need. Um, then there's this discussion about energy and you think about how much energy one of these, you know, a Google data center is going to need when AI is really, really up and running. Um, you know, how they're going to get to their clean energy is a huge issue. So um, goals of, of 2030 and all these other things. So there's a huge discussion about how can government really play a role in solving some of these future problems in technology that we see and how can we um, how can we see the problems? How can we help you know create the best sort of regulatory or incentive policies to get us to that thing? And I think you know um, Dr. Fire has had had it right that there's policy and technology and there's technology and policy and they 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 really have to have a lot of linkages and conversations because it is incredibly important, especially for the U.S. to to get that policy right that gets us through that technology hurdles or into those new technology realms that are are very rapidly coming down. So, thanks. There was probably two questions I didn't answer in that one, but I'm happy to, to let others ask. <laughs> okay. I, I, oh, I did mute. Yes. No. <laughs> no, nothing, no, nothing to add, nothing to add, thanks. Okay, uh, so the next question we have here is, what roles, careers, or other opportunities would you recommend for a technologically educated but policy engaged individual to pursue? Supposing they're interested in researching methods by which the US can accelerate its innovation processes. Okay, so I've got a couple and then I'm happy to pause. Um, we are hiring data scientists. We are hiring PhDs in, in AI and in technology. Um, because we need that expertise. We don't all need to be policy wonks or, or people who have grown up you know, doing that. Um, we have to have the technology component. So our Office of Chief Economist is hiring sort of that, that, that really technical skill set. We are building databases of the semiconductor supply chain. We need you know, experts of data scientists. We need experts in innovative technology. Um, within the State Department for sure. So everything I've just said is, is like we are hiring in those areas, but then our colleagues in commerce are equally doing that perhaps in the, at a higher level um, to think through all of the various policies that they're putting into place with the $50 billion spread across R&D, spread across um, you know, actual production of, of and, and the creation of the semiconductors, the assembly, testing and packaging part. So there are a lot of augmented positions in the government that is bringing that technology experts, PhDs, et cetera, from, from the outside. We, we actually have one, um, a science fellow in our office that um, serves as that bridge between the technology that industry is talking about and that we need to get to and what policy um, we need. So I know that for a fact, um, there's positions there and, and I would imagine in, in, in the science, um, uh, and and sec, or S tech as we call it, the science and technology office. Equally, PhDs are needed, or, or or master students who are bringing, you know, those deep sciences into into the department. I pause there. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. I mean, I think that um, there's an ever expanding num uh, number of roles at the at the State Department and in government for folks with uh, with science and technology backgrounds. The, the Jefferson Science uh, Fellowship, 
think is uh, something that I would definitely look into with for folks with the the kind of uh, PhD or, or higher level uh, science and tech background. But I mean, th there's just so many um, roles now; it's it's hard to uh, hard to hard to list them. And yeah, I think. And then in terms of uh, folks with uh, you know a science focus who are I'm not sure exactly what our audience is made up of but for the undergraduate people I you know highly encourage uh, people to look into internships at the state department um because if they want to get a, a kind of hands-on uh view of of how the policy development process works and how how uh their experience um in science and tech might might uh might feed into that over right on right on um, and so the last question we have here is for Mary or David from the audience. Vietnam is becoming an increasingly more important partner for the U.S. in economics and trade. And we see that in two nations historical relations, um, as well as the proximity of the country to China. So how does the U.S. navigate this complex relationship to increase cooperation with Vietnam without alarming China? Well, uh, Xi Jinping was just in town. <laughs> I can say that. Uh, so we really leave it to the Vietnamese to negotiate. Um, one thing I've learned in my brief time in Vietnam is Vietnam is uh, a pretty uh, proud country that's done really well with itself. It uh, holds up. It's it's beaten China and it's beaten us, and they really know what they're doing. So I think the important thing for us to do is not make it about China, and I think that's where we win. Right, yes, we are competing with China, but the relationship with Vietnam is about Vietnam. And it's, as long as we stay focused on that and we explain it's about the bilateral relationship with you, it's about where we think Vietnam can be a regional leader, where we can partner on regional and global issues. I think um, that is what both of us want. I think when folks talk, and you see a lot of this from the media sometimes about Vietnam as some sort of pawn in the US versus China game, um, we think that's kind of really missing the point in the story. And I would say, if you guys, if any of you are interested in Southeast Asia, you often, um, I think the stories of Southeast Asia and the role that this region is gonna play globally in the future really are underreported. And I think people don't appreciate the dynamism and the incredible, um, just the talent and the energy and uh, all the things the region has to offer. And it kind of gets discounted by stories that just put it as a US versus China game. Um, and really we're here in Vietnam working with the Vietnamese um, on what are our interests. And we will let Vietnam as it has done very well in the past do uh, deal with how it wants to deal with its neighbor to the north. Mm -hmm. And so to round out, that's all the time we have, but if we could just have one final thought or a sentence for a takeaway from each of you, what would you all say? I can say this, I can tell you that as a, someone who works with a team of people who probably a year ago had never heard about semiconductors, um, it is just such an exciting um, challenge to stay on, stay on top of this policy and really see the opportunities in it and not be afraid of it. I, um, I think it's just been wonderful to watch and, and to see people under, start to understand why semiconductors and how it plays a role. And, and so uh, I will not probably be around by the teacher, you know, I will get to a point where I won't be able to take on new things. I already feel like I'm too old sometimes to learn about new things. Um, but I would just say it's been uh, so exciting to keep seeing all the opportunities that technology offers in the diplomacy space. I think I mine would be, go ahead, David, please. I go just ahead. pushed back. I don't, I don't think we're ever, uh, on Mary, Mary uh, Best comments, <laughs> I don't think we're ever too old to learn new things. And Thank if you. you if you can't if you can't learn it, you can train an AI bot to learn it for you. Hey, you guys are better people than I am. So, <laughs> so I think, I think uh, I'll just I'll keep it at one sentence. I just uh, I commend everyone in the audience for their interest in this topic and their uh, spending their time with us today. And feel free to to reach out in the future if you have any any questions about State Department or uh, anything related to the topic. Over. Okay, so for my closing word, I would say, I think, I hope that we have illuminated why a job in the State Department in policy is so tightly intertwined with 
the cutting edge technology and all of the things that we're facing in, in the coming, you know, 10 years, let's say, that we need some of the best and the brightest. So to David's point, thank you for, for joining us. Um, diplomacy spans an amazing amount of issues, as you saw from public diplomacy into technology. And so um, there's just a, a real opportunity there to be on some of the, literally on the cutting edge of some of the biggest issues that are facing the globe. And, and we are sitting right right on top of it, right in the middle. And, and I encourage you, if you're interested in the Foreign Service, in, um, you know, talk to people, talk to folks on this, this call um, and others. And we would, we would very much appreciate you know, further conversations. So thank you. All right, so with that, that's all the time we have for now. Thank you so much to our panelists, Virginia, Mary, Mary Beth, and David. But the fun's not over yet. If you want to learn more about the work of the departments or get more information about our scholarships or internships or employment or fellowships, stick around for our next session and our series of interactive breakout sessions. So before I bid a final farewell, I'd like to invite those on the call to join us next week, February 9th, for a Gilman Foreign Policy in Focus virtual seminar series on global food security. More information on that can be found on the Gilman website. And with that, I'm pleased to hand the virtual mic to my colleague, from the department's Bureau of Global Talent Management, diplomat in residence for the Allegheny region, Sherry Zalika Seitz. Good afternoon now, uh, everyone. I'm glad that you are uh, joining us for the second half. I myself really enjoyed this first half um, when I worked years ago with Allison Schwier. Um, when she was with Senator Coons on something called the End Act to End Wildlife Trafficking. And, um, and then again uh, with her when she was in STAS um, to create um, a number of foreign service positions around the world that are focused specifically on technology and on climate. Um, we um, foreign service officers join the, the foreign service as generalists. Um, but these kinds of, of issues um, span all of our various career tracks. So I'll talk a bit about that and a bit about um, how I began and um, look forward to the breakout sessions where we can get more um, closely um, in more detail on, on our, our careers and our positions. So if you go to the next slide, um, I want to just give a, 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 a brief vision of what the Foreign Service uh, can be like. Um, these are photos from my career um, as a Foreign Service officer. Um, you know, beach cleanups, um, orchestras, um, providing technology to our uh, libraries and American corners, doing emergency relief, uh, listening to communities as they um, talk about what their challenges are and how we might partner. And then uh, there on the left, I spent quite a bit of time um, in, as I said, wildlife trafficking work and, um, and on the ground in uh, conservation efforts. So um, that's just a, a quick visual about uh, what a career might look like and how it spans um, a very broad array of, 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 of engagements. Next. So my career, um, I am a management coned officer, um, which means that um, a good portion of my career has been uh, on the management and leadership of our embassy buildings and our operations overseas. Um, I've been a logistician, um, I've been a human resources officer, I've been a management officer, um, and a management counselor. Not a huge difference between the two, mostly at scale. Um, in Maputo, Mozambique, one of the things that I worked on was um, building a new building, which recently, uh, or designing the building initially, and then later it was built, and it recently won an award um, for its design uh, for reaching gold uh, lead status. Uh, we were shot for, for platinum, but we reached gold. Um, because building green buildings, building in ways that are sustainable is important for the, for the, for, you know, our planet and certainly for our organization. Next. And the other half of my career um, has been in environmental and science diplomacy. The Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs 
has um, three components, oceans, environment, and science. And those, um, the third one, science, is where our science cooperation agreements uh, are advanced, are managed uh, worldwide, are uh, bilateral as well as regional ones. And um, uh, that particular office um, works very, very closely with staff with, of the, the science and technology uh, office where Allison Schreer comes from. And, um, um, but all of us do in various ways. Um, and my particular work has been in ocean and polar affairs. I was a scientific affairs officer there. Um, focused very much on ocean pollution. The big deep water horizon spill was, was my baby in terms of trying to manage the um, uh, recovery efforts uh, from that um, spill. And then I was the deputy director and team lead for wildlife trafficking in the Office of Conservation and Water. I have traveled the globe with um, our Senator and Secretary Kerry um, trying to deal with uh, climate change um, and trying to stem it and trying to deal with the uh, consequences of it. And um, most recently, I was a director of the Office of Environmental Quality, where um, a big part of our team were our AAAS science fellows um, I, our, and our uh, Jefferson science fellows. So uh, we were talked about that a bit earlier too. And, and those fellowship opportunities are a terrific way for um, us to infuse our offices with uh, science expertise. For instance, that particular office is um, spearheading our negotiations on the development of a international agreement to end plastic pollution. And we have a science fellow I uh, was an expert on plastics and um, uh, what we might do to improve plastics in the world to de decrease the amount of pollution that, that they cause, um, traveling the globe, talking about what we can do with this international agreement. Next slide. So let me get down to um, what the information that you might need. And I'm going to cover these next sets of slides very, very quickly so that I can get to your specific questions in the breakout session later. But I wanna give a very high level overview of what kinds of opportunities are available, uh, both as students and as careers um, and um, you know, how you might approach those. So most importantly, we really do want a diverse group of Americans joining our organization. And that diversity includes um, academic discipline diversity. I, I travel Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, going to universities and colleges and um, town halls of various kinds, talking about the, the Department of State and our opportunities. And invariably, everyone wants me to go and speak to the global studies, international relations, uh, political science classes, and I'm happy to do that. But I also really want to speak to all the STEM majors. Um, our, our disciplines are, and what we work on spans the entire range of, of, of um, what anyone might study. Next. So who are we? We are the Foreign Service, which is worldwide, um, Foreign Service Generalists, Foreign Service Specialists. We are also um, uh, the U.S. Civil Service and the uh, Department of State in um, Washington, D.C., but also in uh, other uh, points in the United States. And the majority of our um, employees at each one of our embassies and consulates are locally engaged staff, Foreign Service Nationals. Um, who are the civil service, so to speak, of each embassy. They are the ones who, who hold down and, and keep um, a sense of continuity and local expertise. Next, where are we? We are in 275 posts in 190 countries. Uh, as I said, we're all over the, the, the world. Next. Just a little bit about the organization of an embassy, um, which will really help you to see why there are so many different careers available and on so many different um, approaches to um, international um, diplomacy. And that is, uh, you have our president, you have the secretary, 
And I have highlighted those particular positions I've actually held. Like I've been a principal officer of a consulate, which is equivalent to a deputy chief of mission um, in many ways. I've been the management counselor and, and these are the various parts. So you have management, you have consular, public diplomacy, economics and politics, um, our security offices, and then all the other agencies who are present at an embassy. Um, I can speak to just about all of these, having supervised most of them. So I look forward to our conversation. Next. Our student programs. Our speakers alluded to some of them. Um, and I really want to make sure that everyone understands that there are two kinds of internship programs. There's one um, for students year round. So students can be an intern in the summer or in the fall or in the um, spring. Um, the summer is most competitive, spring and fall are less, um, but all are highly competitive and students should uh, never feel discouraged if they don't get in the first time. And then we have the Foreign Service Internship Program, which is two different summers and it is uh, need-based unlike the Student Internship Program. Next. And then we have fellowships. And these are called gateways into the Foreign Service because once one graduates from the fellowship, um, then you join the Department of State straight away. And there are four fellowships and more under development now. Um, the first two, Pickering and Wrangell, um, that provide for your graduate degree in um, uh, public affairs, in international affairs, international policy, that kind of thing at the graduate level. And once uh, we pay for the graduate um, program, uh, you have development programs in the summers, and then you join. And then the same is true for our Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship and the Diplomatic Security Fellowship except that instead of joining as a foreign service generalist, you'll join as a foreign service IT specialist or a diplomatic security agent. Next. Then, as I said before, we have our civil service. And many of the jobs that um, our panelists spoke of in terms of data scientists and, um, and the like are civil service positions that we are recruiting more and more in the STEM fields than ever before in terms of the policy space. We've always had um, our, our, our STEM colleagues who work on our IT infrastructure, who work as architects and engineers. Um, we were one of the largest holders of real estate in the world. And um, that is a lot to, to manage. So facilities managers and engineers uh, are important part of our, of our foreign service and our civil service. Next. Um, there's a picture of me in our 4th of July. So the Foreign Service Generalists um, have uh, spent most of our careers overseas, but we also spend significant time in the United States. Um, and then um, next slide. Um, we have our Foreign Service Specialists. And about half of Foreign Service officers roughly are specialists and about half are generalists. Um, so we have a, a great deal of hiring in the specialist fields, uh, much more than most people realize. Um, as I said, all 250 plus of our um, embassies and consulates have medical units. So they, we need physicians, we need nurses, we need lab scientists and psychiatrists. We hire social workers. Um, the, um, um, you know, the, the real property management and office management, law enforcement and security and so forth. All of these uh, require um, specific expertise in those areas, um, it, but you also require more and more each of them um, to have a, a, a STEM background. Next. So uh, foreign service officers declare one of the following five career tracks. I am in the management affairs career track. As, I, as I've said, I've also spent about half my career in environment and um, oceans and science. And those are non-tracked types of positions. Our climate positions, our technology positions, our non-career tracked types of positions. And so even if you come in as public diplomacy, you can also, of course, uh, you're going to engage the um, um, 
uh, STI issues in a public diplomacy, but you can also um, engage them um, in positions that are specifically focused on STI um, as an officer. So next. There are lots of reasons to join the Foreign Service. To me, one of the primary reasons is uh, public service, which you can do anywhere, but the overseas lifestyle that you have as a Foreign Service officer is, is unique, um, but it is very challenging. Um, and I love the fact that we are always learning. You're always growing, constant variety and change. If that appeals to you, then this may be uh, the kind of um, career that appeals to you. Next. There are many benefits, and these types of benefits are best kept to uh, a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, that I'd be delighted to have. I can talk about that at the end. But the salaries are competitive, the financial incentives, um, various sources source, sorts make it more competitive than one might believe um, for our tech um, colleagues. So please ignore that. Um, and then next. So um, I'm more than happy to talk about what you might do and where you might serve um, in our chat room. Um, next. I um, am best reached by email or through my LinkedIn, which is Diplomat in Residence Allegheny. Please feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with people um, about their aspirations for their career and whether or not the Department of State um, is good for them uh, about fellowships and internships. Um, I'm fortunate that now that I'm a senior foreign service officer, having 24 years with the Department of State, um, that I'm paid my salary to just uh, do this and try to bring in talent from all over the United States. And for me, most specifically in um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. I'd like to just, um, on careers, next. So you can get to me through that QR code. Um, and also, if you go to www.state.careers.com, um, uh, at state.gov, um, you will see uh, that there are diplomats in residence all over the United States. I'm more than happy to direct you to your diplomat in residence, or you can find them there. Um, I meant to include a slide with that, but but it's it's available to you. And perhaps in the breakout session, I'll I'll pull that up in, in the screen. So that's it for me for now. I look forward to uh, answering questions and engaging in conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that wonderful and insightful presentation. I hope everyone was able to take away something from that presentation and hopefully spark your interest about a future career with the State Department. So everyone uh, will now have the opportunity to now go into breakout rooms to hear more closely from speakers about their work and career pathways to the State Department. Uh, you'll also see speaker bios in the chat, so you, you could read um, about your speaker. And also the slide here on the screen will show you uh, specifically what topics that everyone will be talk, uh, going over. Uh, room one will be Sherry Zalika Sykes. We'll have the Q&A regarding State Department careers and student programs. Uh, room two, uh, Samantha Jordan will talk about uh, her life in the Foreign Service. Uh, room three, uh, Dan will talk about uh, State Department exchange and scholarship programs. Uh, and Virginia Kent will also uh, hold number uh, room four, who will talk about um, semiconductor diplomacy in the chip sacks. So if you have additional questions for Virginia, feel free to join her breakout room. And then last but not least, room five, Jeremiah, our panel moderator, uh, will talk about his journey from a Gilman alum, like many of you attending this, uh, to a foreign service specialist and a FATE fellow. Uh, I do want to note that breakout rooms will not be recorded, and, but will resume after the breakout rooms close. Uh, some of these rooms may have lots of attendees as well joining, so please use the raise hand function in Zoom to ask for questions in the breakout room and the speaker will call on you. Um, since we got started a little bit late, uh, we are going to have these rooms open till about 105 Eastern, but you do have the ability to switch rooms whenever you like. And on that note, you should now be able to select which breakout room you'd like. And if you need any assistance joining the breakout room, please feel free to message me and uh, just let me know and we can move you there.
Thanks to everyone. Um, Ace, thank you very much. And thanks to all of our uh, breakout session panelists. Um, my name is Dan Paterini. I'm part of the team at USA Study Abroad that helped to put together the, the Inside U.S. Foreign Policy series, of which today was the final um, in this particular series. But the fun's not over, as we say. If you have an interest at all in global food security, which I think we all do, uh, we have a four-part Foreign Policy and Focus on Global Food Security series, virtual series, each about an hour long, that begins next Friday, February 9th. This is in conjunction with Pennsylvania State University. We'd love to see people there. You can register. You can attend one or all if you uh, would like. We'd love to see you at all of those uh, and really explore what is an, a critically, crucially important topic, um, not only for the United States, for but for everyone around the world. So uh, we want to thank you. Please, 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 you'll get a survey of today's event. Fill that survey out. We want you to tell us what we can do better, and we want to thank you for attending, but we really want to get better, improve, and, and the only way we can do that is by hearing from you. So with that, I want to thank our keynote speaker. I want to thank our panel members. I want to thank each of the uh, breakout session leaders, and most importantly, thank you for all of you who, are, uh, who attended today. We hope you got something out of this, and we hope it was very meaningful. Uh, we appreciate you being part of the audience today, and thank you. Wish you the very best going forward. Thanks for thanks for attending.